Okay, hello everybody. It's such a pleasure to be here today and speak with you about tourmaline as a gemstone. I'm Brendan Lors, the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Gemology, and I've been a tourmaline lover ever since I, I got interested in gems, so this uh, topic is near and dear to my heart. And uh, what we'll be talking about today is uh, a variety of topics related to tourmaline, um, starting with the gem varieties and some of the um, looking at the species of gem tourmaline and some of the coloration causes and um, also the origin related to those different species of how they formed. And then we'll be getting into um, some of the challenges for gemological laboratories, specifically origin determination. And that is particularly important for the Pariba type tourmalines, which we'll be spending a little bit more time on uh, as compared to the other varieties, simply because they're more valuable and they have a, a greater importance in the trade for um, from a, an identification and origin determination standpoint. And then uh, we'll also be looking at some of the internal features in tourmaline and, and uh, wrapping up with some future directions. So without further ado, uh, the criteria for gem tourmaline. So what does it take to make tourmaline as a gemstone? Um, first of all, you must have material that's large and transparent enough for cutting as, as either cabochons or faceted stones. And in addition to the, to the size and transparency, you should have, of course, a desirable color. And with tourmaline, that is, that is simple in many cases because tourmaline comes with a huge variety of colors. And, um, but I should also mention that even black tourmaline has been used as a gemstone. As we can see uh, in this slide here, we've got a, a beautiful pendant set with a black tourmaline courtesy of Barb Dutro, um, showing that tourmaline does have beautiful um, high luster. So even when it's black, it can be uh, set in unusual jewelry designs. But most of the tourmaline we encounter in the trade is of course um, colored. And in order for tourmaline to show an attractive color, there's two main factors that need to take place. First of all, you need to have a low concentration of iron three plus. And this is mainly because um, it's very common for traces of iron 2 plus to be present in tourmaline. And when iron 3 plus is also present, in addition, you get a strong interaction between those elements that can cause a very intense coloration that at the thickness of a gemstone will make it appear black. Uh, the other thing that's helpful is to have a low concentration of titanium. And that's because when you have an iron titanium interaction, you can also get a brown coloration and it doesn't take much of either iron 3 plus or ti4 plus to make uh, very strong coloration so the lower amounts of those elements uh, available for during the formation the better off we have for the chances of getting an attractive gem quality tourmaline so here's a, just a rundown on um, the varieties and the species that we'll be looking at and um, the gem tourmaline falls in two major groups um, first of all we have the Elbaite, Lidocotite, Rosmanite series. Um, there are a variety of other species that can come into play here, like Silacite, which is a manganese-rich variety. Uh, there's another variety called Daryl Henryite, which was recently named after a famous mineralogist, Daryl Henry, who has studied tourmaline for a long time and made some valuable contributions to its uh, characterization. But um, for the purpose of most gem tourmalines, uh, we have Elbaite as the dominant species. And as we can see here, these tourmaline is a, is, a, is a rather long formula, but simplistically looking at these, it's, there's only variations in a couple of different things here that are significant in these species. So for Elbaite, the main characteristic that we're looking at is sodium, whereas Lidocotite, it's, it's calcium, Rosmanite, it's actually a vacancy, which is what the square uh, stands for in the formula here. Um, so when we have a vacancy in, in the X site, that's when we have uh, rosmanite. So these elements are all on the X site of tourmaline. And then there's another site called the Y site, which is here. And it's substitutions of trace elements into that Y site, which are um, causing the color in tourmaline. And um, so we'll get back into that a little bit later here. But um, uh, in general, all of these tourmalines, as we can see here, have lithium in them. So they're all lithium tourmalines and they're hosted by granitic pegmatites. So that's the main um, place where you're gonna be finding these in, in nature and where the most of the mining takes place for gem quality tourmalines, either the granitic pegmatites or residual deposits that were weathered from them. 
Uh, they have a worldwide distribution. They're found in, on every major continent uh, except Antarctica. Uh, the colors are incredibly varied, and in addition to having a, a wide variety, we can also have color zoning within single crystals and in single gemstones, uh, making attractive like watermelon bicolor stones that we're so familiar with. And um, the main varieties, pink to, to red, are um, colored by manganese, three plus, and uh, these are usually called rubellite in the trade. And then we have green, which is colored by an iron titanium charge transfer together with iron two plus, usually called vertilite. Uh, there's blue tourmalines colored just by iron two plus alone. And then those are commonly called indicolite or indigolite in the trade, indigo sort of referring to that coloration. We can have colorless tourmalines, which are actually rather uncommon. Uh, here's an example here from Nigeria. And um, the reason why they're uncommon is because tourmaline is, many people refer to it as like a garbage can mineral. Like, I, I don't like to use that term because it sounds kind of derogatory, but it does take in all kinds of trace elements. And that is, that is the reason why um, in its growth formation, you commonly have these available to cause the different colors. So it's rare for, for tourmaline to actually be so pure as to be uh, just considered acrolyte where it has no um, uh, trace elements that cause color. Uh, there's another sub-variety, which is a bright yellow to greenish yellow um, tourmaline colored by manganese iron or manganese titanium charge transfer together with manganese 2 plus. And that is this bright yellow variety called canary tourmaline. And most of it comes from Zambia. And then, of course, the most important uh, intense blue, violetish blue, and greenish blue variety, which is colored by copper, commonly with presence of uh, some manganese as well and that's referred to as Pariba tourmaline or Cuprian tourmaline in the trade. Beautiful material we see here from Brazil. So the other major um, group of gem tourmalines are the dravite uvite gemstones, and these are actually much less common in the trade, much less common to find them in nature and gem quality material. They're, they're not all that uncommon in metamorphic rocks as grains that are too small or dark or um, included, but to find them in gem quality is, is less common. And uh, the main things we're looking at here, these are our non-lithium tourmalines. As you see here, there's no lithium in the formula. And they're characterized by the presence of magnesium and also some sodium and calcium in the case of uvite. We've got uh, uh, calcium and magnesium. So um, the main difference between these from a chemical standpoint is we have sodium in the dravite and calcium in the uvite. And these can form a complete solid solution between the two, so you can get variations um, along the, the range from in the composition. So these lithium-free tourmalines are hosted by magnesium to calcic metamorphic rocks uh, or pegmatites where they're associated with ultramafic rocks. So these are not your typical pegmatites that form the other types of tourmaline that, that are lithium-bearing, but usually these have had extensive interaction with the, with the host rocks which is the way that they derive these higher concentrations of calcium and magnesium. Um, most of these deposits are in East Africa, and sometimes you do find the dravites in, in Canada that can be gem quality as well. The coloration tends to be a little bit more restricted on these than in the previous group that we talked about. Um, earth tone colors are very common, so these, well, we'll look at the varieties below in a little more detail. Um, but then you also have these dark greens, deep green colors that are um, commonly called chrome tourmaline. So um, the varieties in, in general, we have this yellow to orange to brown range that are caused by iron titanium charge transfer. Uh, once again, if we have too much of, of those elements, then they'll just appear dark. They'll look black at the um, thickness of a gemstone. So just small traces of these elements are what we need in order to get these desirable colors. Um, and they commonly produce what are called in the trade as golden tourmalines. And then if you add a tinge of green, usually from chromium uh, or even vanadium, you can get what's called savanna tourmalines. And these are commonly strongly dichroic and they, they have these orangey, yellowy to slight green colorations. And uh, there's also a very rare red occurrence of red dravite colored by iron uh, two plus, iron three plus charge transfer. And that's also comes from Africa, and although usually small and very darkly colored, so uh, not very important for gemstones. 
But most significant are these chrome tourmalines. These are these deep green, beautiful colored stones that are colored by a combination of chromium and vanadium or both. Um, usually, even though we call them chrome tourmaline, for some reason, even that's a desirable trade name, that in nature, they actually tend to occur as um, vanadium being the most abundant uh, element coloring those. And then most recently, um, we've got a new example of a blue dravite that was gem quality that was just documented um, in the Journal of Gemology earlier this year. Um, it comes from Sri Lanka. It's from the Elahera gem field, which is a well-known gem deposit in um, Sri Lanka. And it's possible that mo more of these stones have existed or exist, but just haven't been recognized as tourmaline because you get a wide variety of, of gem uh, varieties that come from the, these gravels. But um, this material is just is colored by iron 2 plus, just like the other term, blue tourmaline that we talked about earlier. Now you can have three major textural variations in tourmaline. Most of the time you don't see these uh, in, in gem quality material, but occasionally we do get these beautiful chatoyant stones showing these nice sharp cat's eyes. Um, these are caused by growth tubes, parallel growth tubes that are oriented parallel to the C axis in tourmaline. And um, they, tend to, they tend to occur from major localities like in Brazil. We see these in the blue to green range and also Afghanistan, for example. Um, we do get some right from here in California as well. Um, a, a rare example of star tourmaline is shown here. Star tourmaline has is, is only been documented in a few examples. And this, this particular stone from Martin Steinbeck's book in 2016 shows a beautiful six ray star looking down the sea axis on a polished crystal. So these are incredibly unusual. If you ever see one of these, grab it. Um, we also have trapiche tourmaline. And again, these are, these are quite unusual. They typically come from Zambia, um, Uvite, Dravite series, usually green from traces of iron and, and uh, I'm sorry, traces of vanadium and uh, possibly chromium in this material. And what you have are some graphitic inclusions that are um, concentrated in specific sectors of these crystals so that when you slice them perpendicular to the C axis, you get these really interesting color zones in the trapeche type material. But very, very unusual to, to encounter that as well. So localities, uh, gem tourmaline, as I mentioned earlier, is very widespread. And currently most of the important commercial localities are in Africa. So we're looking at for example, Nigeria, Mozambique, Namibia, Tanzania, Kenya, and uh, most recently, the Democratic Republic of Congo, which has been producing some beautiful pastel colored uh, stones, even some bicolor, tricolor stones as a byproduct of um, coltan mining or, or tin and, and uh, niobium tantalum oxide mining that they're doing in secondary deposits. And in some cases, in the actual pegmatites, they're finding some beautiful gem tourmalines just in the past couple of years. We also have, uh, of course, Madagascar as a source, Brazil, Afghanistan, and uh, here in the United States, we've got Maine and California, it's two states that produce tourmaline occasionally, although not very often in gem quality these days. They were more, more famous uh, earlier in the century, so earlier last century, I should even say. Um, the stones shown here are just some examples from each country, but aren't necessarily meant to be representative in any case of tourmaline from these countries. You can get many different colors um, and appearances from, from each country. The only exception being uh, this, this stone from Madagascar that shows the interesting oscillatory color zoning. That is pretty unique to Madagascar. I'm not really aware of other deposits. There's uh, very rarely in Brazil you can find material that shows such oscillatory zoning, but Madagascar is also um, the source of these very famous uh, slices that have the beautiful um, color zoning that changes colors, you know, dozens of times within a single crystal. Um, so going on now, we'll look a little bit at value. This is just a brief overview um, of tourmaline value factors. And um, what I did is I, I went into the gem guide, wholesale pricing guide to get some, for, for sake of comparison, some pricing ranges for tourmaline um, that are four to five carats in size, top quality, and um, of the various color varieties. And so in general, what we see is most of the commercially uh, available tourmaline in the market, which is this pink to red to green, the blue range, 
um, is in the 500 to 600 dollars a carat, just in general for for wholesale values, and that includes the uh, canary tourmaline as well. Um, interestingly, though, when we get to the chrome tourmaline, we have a pretty significant jump in value, where we go right up to a thousand dollars a carat, so almost a doubling in value from the previous categories we were just talking about. And then you can get a much higher jump as soon as you introduce copper into the mix. So you get the periabotite tourmalines, these beautiful blues to greens. Uh, typically, um, those stones have low iron, so those colors are just left to just pop and be really that so-called neon or electric color. And these stones, um, the value of these, because of their rarity and their desirability, goes up really high compared to the other ones. So we jump up to $14,000 a carat in general for the Mozambique and Nigerian stones. And even more interesting, we get a much higher jump for the Brazilian material, $60,000 a carat, not uncommon in high, high quality material. Um, even higher values are, are not unheard of, especially when you get larger stones. So this makes paribotermaline from Brazil actually the second most valuable colored gemstone after Burmese ruby. Pretty interesting stuff. Um, well, let's take a little bit closer look at this material from Brazil. This is the Batalha mine in northeastern Brazil. Mina de Batalha is the original locality where copper-bearing tourmaline was first discovered back in 1982, although it didn't appear in the market until 1989. And um, this, this material was initially suspected to be either synthetic or treated or something going on because the colors were simply unheard of, things we haven't seen in the trade before. Uh, and the initial asking prices, of course, based on the suspicion that they were maybe not real, were rather low. And then astronomically, the prices just shot up. So if, if any of you were, uh, avail were around in the market back in the early uh, 1990s and late 80s when this came online and were able to get any of this at the initial asking prices of a few hundred dollars a carat, you're quite fortunate. Um, so that was the first time it was thoroughly documented in, in articles in the literature and found to be not treated and no uh, synthetics involved here at all. And it was the first time that copper was seen as being the coloring agent in tourmaline. And generally only traces of copper are needed. So most periva tourmaline has on the range of a half a weight percent to up to two weight percent or so of copper oxide. Um, and that combined with the low iron content is all it takes to make this, these extraordinary colors pop out. Um, shortly after, in the early 90s, the Mulungu mine came online, which is uh, called by a variety of other names. This is in um, about 60 kilometers north of Batalha in the Rio Grande do Norte state. So it's in the neighboring state, not in Paraiba state, but the next state to the north. And um, there are actually two deposits there. The other deposit called Alto dos Quintos was discovered in the 1990s, also known as the Veald Mine, and it's slightly closer to the to the Batalha Mine, about 45 kilometers northeast of there, also in the Rio Grande do Norte state. So um, all three of these Brazilian deposits are hosted by granitic pegmatites, so they're in situ deposits, um, and the pegmatites are what's called part of the Bora Barema pegmatite province, which is about 550 to 500 million years old that intrudes quartzites and metaconglomerates of the Ecuador formation in what's called the Cerrito full belt. So this is a um, fairly constrained geological um, environment for these types of tourmaline deposits. And of course, if you're interested in finding more of this valuable tourmaline, a good place to look is are in these pegmatites hosted by these host rocks in this particular full belt. But as you'd expect, there has been a lot of exploration for these since the original discoveries. And there are a few other occurrences that have been discovered, but until now, none of them have proven to be commercially significant or um, viable from, from that standpoint. And the existing deposits are um, getting worked out. There's still some production, but it's becoming more and more rare to find new material uh, from these mines in the trade. And that, of course, contributes to their value. So the other localities for copper-bearing tourmaline are Nigeria and Mozambique. These came online more recently. Um, in 2001, we started to see the material from Nigeria. There are um, at least two, possibly more localities there. Um, they seem to be 
all within the Aloran area of the Ibadan region in Oyo State. Um, but very little seems to be known about these. Uh, what's interesting geologically um, is that these deposits, uh, because these, these are in rocks of the Pan-African age, so these are, are four, you know, 450 to 500 uh, million years old, the, at the time that they formed, um, South America and Africa were actually together before they rifted apart um, due to continent, continental drift or plate tectonics. So um, that meant that Nigeria and Brazil were actually very close together when these formed. So it's not surprising that you have both Nigeria and Brazil as sources of this type of tourmaline. Um, the other place in Mozambique um, is actually currently the, the world's most important deposit for um, copper-bearing tourmaline, and that is Mavuko. It was discovered in 2003, and it produces many different colors of copper-bearing tourmaline. Um, here, this photo on the bottom just shows a few examples. Uh, these are all untreated colors as they come out of the ground that can contain copper. And when you add uh, manganese, you get some of the uh, more purple colors. When you add some of the, some more iron, but not too much, you get um, some of the greens. So, uh, and then you can you can heat treat, as we'll see later. You can heat treat the um, manganese bearing ones, and you can get the nice blue colors. So um, this is all elbaite, and these are occurring within residual deposits that are inferred to have come from granitic pegmatites um, in the Alto Lingona district of Mozambique. Um, interestingly enough, only 10 kilometers away, we have a much different type of deposit of copper-bearing tourmaline at Maraca. This was discovered more recently, just in 2014, and this deposit exclusively produces copper-bearing liticotite. So instead of elbaite, we now have copper bearing liticotite. And all the material from this deposit, unlike the, the large variety of colors we see from Mavuco, as we see here in the upper right, it's all that violet to, to, violet to pink coloration, which does turn blue after heat treatment. So again, residual deposits there, although they don't appear to be as large or extensive as the Mavuco deposits. So when we have tourmaline from these three different localities that all has copper, um, and it's been sold in the trade um, by a variety of names, it's important to look at some nomenclature issues. And um, there's been some controversy about this because what has happened is that currently in the gem trade, the word pariiba is now used to refer to bright blue to green copper bearing tourmaline regardless of its origin. So it doesn't matter if it's from Mozambique or Nigeria or Brazil, people um, still call it pariiba tourmaline. So what's happened is that we have a term that originally started um, as an origin term, specifically referring to the state in Brazil where the tourmaline was first discovered and the most famous deposit where the material still comes from. And now that term is being used to apply much more broadly to all copper bearing tourmaline in the trade. Um, and this is okay as long as people recognize the, um, what is being done here. So, the Laboratory Manual Harmonization Committee, or the LMHC, back in 2012, they're kind of in charge of setting some of the nomenclature um, rules for the laboratories, and they came together and sort of got everybody on the same page with respect to this. And so there's the formal definition that they give here, where you can see the, the color range and the fact that it has copper, and it also usually has manganese in it, um, of whatever geographic origin is called Pariiba. So um, just something important to keep in mind. So when you hear that word nowadays, you know what it's, it's exactly what it's being referred to. Still um, in the technical literature and, and in the journal gemology in particular, we didn't tend to prefer to use that word um, with a modifier. So for example, if we're talking about Mozambique material, we'll say it's Paraiba type rather than just Paraiba, just, just to give it a little bit more accuracy from a technical standpoint. So, what we have now is, is Brazilian Pariba tourmaline, which is much more highly valued in the trade than the material from Mozambique and Nigeria. So, and this is due to a combination of a high market demand and a limited supply. And um, when you also want to differentiate these tourmalines in the laboratory, you find out that there's actually a fair amount of chemical overlap between them. And in this early diagram from Abdurium et al. in 2006, we can see um, in these trace element, minor element variations that um, material from Brazil here 
does show some significant overlap with Nigeria, as well as some of the stones from, from Mozambique. In addition, you can have a fairly large overlap between Nigeria and Mozambique shown here. But this is with um, a particular range of elements that have since been uh, looked at a little bit more, so we've got better refinement now. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But um, the main thing to consider with this is that um, and is that it's not easy to tell these apart just from, from, from standard chemical analyses. We need to do some more detailed work to differentiate these. And um, it's also because of the, the complexities in doing this, when you look at the three deposits from Brazil in particular, it's really hard to tell those apart. So in general, we just lump all three of those deposits together as simply Brazil, even though um, there are some variations between them and, and the typical amounts of saturation and color that you see between those uh, three deposits. So in general then, what the labs are tasked with differentiating these days are simply, we need to tell whether if it's Brazil, Nigeria, or Mozambique, in particular, um, whether if it's Brazil versus Nigeria or Mozambique. Um, a few years ago, back in, actually a decade ago, in, in 2011, Ludwig et al. did a very interesting study where they analyzed the isotopes in this pyrebotype tourmaline, and the lithium and boron isotopes in particular can be used to, to come up with some very definitive uh, groupings for the tourmaline from the three areas. So as you see here, these do not show any overlap. As, granted, there was a, a limited number of analyses that were done, but the technique shows a lot of promise for differentiating the three localities. Um, the only thing is, is that this was done, um, you can only do isotopes in this, in this uh, accurate way with the SIMS technique, which is secondary ion mass spectroscopy, mass spectrometry. And that technique is not commercially available in gem labs. It's very expensive and not easy, easily found. It's usually more in, in research laboratories. So we still needed a way of reliably separating these in more of a routine gem lab setting. So there was a, a lot more work that was done, um, including some work recently by Barb Dutro and her colleagues and um, Katsurata et al. Was, uh, this was just published in 2019 as well, showing six different trace elements um, that have been used to differentiate these tourmalines. And while a single pair of these elements may not be definitive, in fact, um, you, you can see here that there is some overlap in Nigeria um, and Brazil using some of these plots that um, when you take several different varieties or several different combinations of these, and um, sort of combine the discriminators, you can get a robust determination of the three localities. So that's, that's really important. There's been further refinements and uh, the SSCF lab in Switzerland is, uh, has used uh, tin, gallium, and, and germanium as um, three elements using these, or these uh, three dimensional plots to get some very nice groupings that separate the tourmalines from the, the, the different localities. And here's an example of a case study of a stone, a five carat beautiful uh, stone that was submitted to the lab. It showed, uh, the UV best picture spectrum showed uh, copper as the cause of coloration, which is exactly what you'd expect when you see this amazing color. And um, when the chemical data for this stone was plotted, it plotted right within a reliable area to, dif to differentiate it as Brazilian. So um, if we just take this a step further and we think a little bit about the values we were talking earlier, if you were then to use those sort of general values uh, to come up with a hypothetical value for the stone, with the Brazil origin, we're looking at 300,000. With the other origins, it would only be 70,000. So right there, you can see the importance of making accurate uh, locality of origin determinations for this type of tourmaline. Now there's been even further work done um, on differentiating tourmaline using trace elements. In this case, again, by the SSCF, they have been taking their um, laser ICPMS data and they're performing uh, statistical correlation um, uh, data crunching on multi-element data sets. So where you take you know, numerous, dozens of different elements, in this case, 53 different elements um, we're, we're put into the software. It's a, it's a statistical software, which is called TSNE. It's an algorithm that, that's used to look for, for where the computer looks for groupings within this data. 
And by doing that, they've been able to come up with some really good clusters of um, the data for the tourmaline from these different localities. So they can get a, a very high degree of confidence now of separating tourmaline from the three localities. So uh, this work has just, just been coming out in an abstract and more work is, is being done as we speak on this interesting technique. Uh, I should also mention just, just recently in the journal, we published an article by them that discusses the application of the statistical technique to emerald determination, looking at um, some of the new deposits in Afghanistan and how those can be differentiated using trace elements. And they have another article in the literature that does this in more detail. Now, um, if you're doing origin determination on tourmaline, of course, it's important to keep track of new deposits and, and new developments in that uh, in the field. And recently, um, some of the labs have been seeing some new type of material coming in from Nigeria, which is copper bearing, but it's much different than the material we've seen in the past. And the SSCF lab actually documented this stone um, recently in the Facet magazine. It's a 60 carat stone. So as you can see, a significant, beautiful stone on the left here, which has a coloration that's quite similar to the non-copper bearing blue tourmaline from some places like Namibia, and, uh, Afghanistan and elsewhere, you get this so-called seafoam tourmaline, for example, which is a, a beautiful color, but not copper bearing. And in this case, the chemical analysis of the stone from Nigeria showed that it matched the chemical array for Nigerian copper bearing tourmaline with everything except for one thing, and that was that it contained a significant amount of iron. Even though there wasn't much iron, when you compare it to normal periva tourmaline, it was uh, much more than, than we've seen in the past. Um, so here, as we see the, the trace element data, typically you only get less than uh, below detection limit for the microprobe up to 0.03 weight percent um, of iron oxide in copper bearing tourmaline, rarely up to a half a weight percent. So um, that's not much iron, but this stone had a little bit more than we normally see. And that tells us that chances are, even though we don't know exactly from where in Nigeria this is coming from, that this is a new deposit or at least a new uh, production of material in Nigeria that is different from, from material we've seen in the past. So always important for the labs to keep track of what's coming out of the ground. Um, we'll look now at, at some of the treatments uh, that we see in um, tourmaline. And what, what's happening, um, is with the heat treatment in particular, this is very widespread, very common. And um, it's, it's a permanent treatment, so it's, it's well accepted in the trade. So it's stable to heat and light once it's been treated. And it's typically not detectable because the heat treatment is relatively low temperature. So 550 degrees centigrade um, in air is done to remove a grayish component um, from many different colors of tourmaline. We also um, do this, see this technique applied to the blue to green tourmaline to light and dark tones. And then um, it's also done in the canary type tourmaline to reduce a brownish or orangish coloration in um, that yellow, bright yellow tourmaline. Um, and finally, as we see here in this photo, it's done to produce an attractive uh, blue coloration in the copper bearing tourmaline, uh, especially the material from Mozambique. We, we typically get these um, manganese varieties that contain, that, that show some violet colors. And those can be heated to, um, again, about 550 degrees centigrade. And um, when that happens, what, what we're effectively doing, as we see in the spectrum here, is we're converting the manganese 3 plus to manganese 2 plus. And manganese 3 plus has a very strong absorption in tourmaline, whereas manganese 2 plus just has a small peak that's sort of offset what we're seeing then is this big decrease in this absorption, which causes and allows the, the, the copper uh, absorptions at 700 and 900, um, which are just sort of on the edge of the visible spectrum here. Um, there, we're allowing those to kind of come through more, and that's what allows this beautiful uh, turquoise color to come through after heat treatment. Um, interestingly, there are occasionally some microscopic evidences of, of heat treatment in tourmaline. And although it's not common, it's possible that, that it, you may see some, some minute tension fractures, such as those seen here. And the other thing which can be interesting are when you get uh, epigenetic fillings in fractures, usually this is consisting of limonite, and um, just from the way iron oxide 
um, goes into these fractures and in, in natural deposits. But when that's heated in, in the lab, the, the limonite then converts to hematite. And that's associated with a darkening of the color from sort of an orangey to a reddy color. But you can confirm that it's actually hematite with Ramon spectroscopy. So by analyzing this, this material in a fracture, you can then tell if you get hematite that this stone has been heated. Um, conversely, you can also have microscopic evidence that a stone has been unheated. And in this example shown on the lower left here, what we have is um, copper bearing tourmaline. Most of this is from Mozambique. It shows these interesting um, staining of pink staining, violet staining around growth tubes. And this is a result of natural irradiation that occurred after the stones formed and were deposited in this residual environment. You had radioactive solutions that came in and entered these surface reaching channels, went into the tourmaline, and cause this local irradiation, making these, these little blue, I mean, violetish colors in the blue tourmaline. And if this had been heated then, as we saw in the previous slide, all this coloration would have gone away. So you know when you see this that such stones have not actually been heated. Now, speaking of irradiation a little bit more, um, this is very commonly done to pink to red uh, tourmaline and with the purpose of, of enhancing or deepening that pink to red color. So you can even start with colorless material and end up with an attractive pink to red color, depending on the doses. Um, recently, just earlier this year in the journal Gemology, we had a nice study published on this that investigated um, the influence of using two different techniques, either electron beams or gamma rays, um, to cause this change of color in tourmaline. And normally what we use in the trade um, is our gamma rays, because they're more widely available in the labs that do the treatment. The electron irradiation is a little bit harder to do because you need a, a reactor to do that. And also, if the dose is too high, you can end up with residual reacti radioactivity, which of course is a no-no in gem quality tourmaline. But um, it's possible, as the author showed in this study, there was no residual radioactivity. If you use a low, low enough dose rate, then you don't have to worry about that. Um, but the authors, what they found is that the electron beam is slightly more effective in causing that color with at the same dose rate as the gamma rays. And the other thing they showed is if you have a low amount of manganese to begin with, in some cases, and we're not exactly sure why, you get this uh, orangey kind of color in tourmaline instead of the, the uh, manganese rich, and then three plus rich pink color. And they think that we think now that, that this orangey color is due to oxygen related hole centers that, that form in the structure with the irradiation. Um, but generally, if you have less manganese, you have a higher possibility of this happening. Um, again, these, these irradiated colors are completely stable. Um, they don't fade with light or, or, or heat unless you heat them up again to the temperatures that are necessary for heat treatment. And they're not detectable by routine gem testing. The other type of treatment that, uh, and this, this case is detectable and is commonly um, looked at by labs are uh, clarity enhancement using uh, fissure fillings with either epoxy resins or oil. And this is commonly done with um, copper bearing tourmaline in particular because of the, the goal to try to influence the uh, perceived value of this high value material. So um, in this example, you can see here the stone that came into the SSCF lab before it was cleaned, um, had minor oil in the fractures, but after cleaning, all of a sudden these, these fractures here are quite um, you know, visible. And um, this, fortunately this technique or this uh, treatment can be easily determined by microscopic examination, Raman or infrared uh, spectroscopy and UV imaging. Um, here's another example of a stone that came into the SSCF lab, oil and the fissures, or actually this one had resin, and, but it was easily detected because you could see this incomplete area leaving this large gas bubble. And also there was a flash effect. When you look at some of the, the fractures sort of end on, you get these orange and violet color colors that come in, um, which, which we are well familiar with filled corundum, which, which form these flash effects in such material. Microscopic examination can also be really nice for showing um, color zoning and, and some of the formation deposit of the deposits, the conditions in which this tourmaline crystallize. So what we're looking at in these uh, beautiful examples of color zoning are changes in chemical composition during the, the actual crystallization 
of the stone. And in some cases, you even have cross-cutting fractures, which were then healed by later growths of tourmaline of even a different composition. And for those of you interested in looking at some of the beautiful patterns in, in tourmalines, I recommend Paul Rustemeyer's book uh, published in 2015. Um, most of the inclusions in tourmaline are, are of the variety of, of fluid inclusions, which we call trichites. But occasionally, you do see solid inclusions, like those shown here. And um, these are pyrochlor inclusions, which is a niobium tantalum oxide mineral, which is commonly formed in pegmatites. So by seeing this, you, you can tell immediately that these are pegmatitic type tourmalines. And in fact, there is a large suite of mineral inclusions in tourmaline that are related to pegmatites. As you see here, these are all known minerals and pegmatites. So when you see these, you say, aha, this is formed in a pegmatite. Um, by contrast, the inclusions that the mineral inclusions that form in the metamorphic tourmalines, for example, um, like the, the dravites and the uvites we were talking about earlier, those are much less common. And when you do see them, you might see pyrite or amphiboles, possibly graphite and unidentified pinpoints. So uh, again, you have some indications here just based on the solid inclusions of the formation environment. Um, and then the, the third or the second um, volume of the photo atlas also has a whole section on tourmaline inclusions, which I recommend for more on that. And then uh, this is quite interesting. If you, if you encounter this type of solid inclusion in tourmaline, then you know for sure um, where the tourmaline is from. These are copper bearing or copper platelets and dendrites that form in tourmaline only from Brazil. So if you have a copper bearing tourmaline and you see these dendrites or these platelets, you know it's a Brazilian tourmaline. Future directions. Um, where are we going with tourmaline research? Well, I feel that, that the material, the, the dravite, uvite gemstones in particular, the um, chrome tourmalines, there's still a lot to be learned about the formation of these and how they occur in nature. And there's been relatively few studies geologically in the field on these deposits. So I think that would be really helpful to do in the future so that we can better characterize how they form. Um, likewise, the famous Mina de Batalha deposit, um, which is shown here in this photo with the mine owner, Ator Barbosa, uh, Barbosa, you can see the pegmatite here in the ceiling. This has actually been very um, little studied from a, from a rigorous uh, geological standpoint. And one of the big questions is where does the copper come from to make the, the coloration in this tourmaline? It's not well known because the um, host rocks here being quartzites, it can't be coming from directly from the host rocks. So it'd be really interesting to do some more uh, detailed studies, field studies of these deposits, as well as those in Nigeria that make copper bearing tourmaline, since so little is known. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's important to keep track of new sources of copper bearing tourmaline so that we can make sure we can have a, an ongoing accurate locality determination. And uh, I think it's also important to monitor developments in th synthesizing gem quality tourmaline. And, so far, uh, efforts to produce synthetic tourmaline have only yielded small overgrowths, like we see here in this example. It's a one, one millimeter thick overgrowth of tourmaline on a natural tourmaline seed. Uh, that doesn't mean it's, it's going to be impossible to grow this in the future, and so we should definitely be sure that, as um, in the gemological community, we keep track of, of growth uh, developments in tourmaline. Um, and then, of course, methods to identify the irradiation and treatment, heat treatment of tourmaline, as well as other stones, would be um, useful to keep on track. So in conclusion, um, simply we have most gem, gem tourmalines consist of elbaite uh, with mixtures of lyticotite and rosmanite and other species. Um, the copper-bearing tourmalines, as we heard, are, are highly valued, with those from Brazil being much higher valued than from uh, Nigeria and Mozambique. And um, in the case of tourmaline, the main uh, challenges for the labs are determining the origin of these stones and also looking at clarity enhancements and identifying those. So I'd like to um, thank some people who really helped with this presentation. Drs. Michael Shrenicki and Hao Wang at the SSCF provided uh, the beautiful images and some of the very interesting information that we saw in this talk. Uh, Bill Larson and Mia Dixon at Pell International provided numerous images. And Nathan Renfro at GIA provided some of the beautiful photomicrographs that we saw. And um, also in closing, for those of you who would like further information, I want to mention there's been in the last decade or so some really nice monographs published on tourmaline as a mineral. And um, in the journal itself, we've got 
these bibliographies that we prepared where every article that we've ever published going back to 1947 on different gem, material, different gem materials, including tourmaline, as we see here, um, are, are downloadable. You can download these bibliographies free of charge on our website and then go into the archive and any article that is less than um, or greater than two years old, you can download for free as well. Um, those issues are available for download online. So with that, um, I'd like to wrap it up and take any questions. Thank you. So un unfortunately, we don't have time for questions. Uh, okay. Brendan, we have run slightly over. However, okay. if anyone uh, does have questions for Brendan, then please uh, email us at events at gem-a.com and we will pass them across to Brendan and come back to you. And thank you again, Brendan, for your talk today. Thank you. It was a pleasure.